vector by which these poems view their subjects. The subjects of these poems are, are the women who worked as housekeepers or cleaning ladies or maids, as we called them when I was a girl, and the decorous kinds of racism and classism that informed their lives and their stories. The term microaggression was coined by a psychologist named Chester A. Pierce in 1970, so it wasn't in use when my parents elected not to drive our living maid Cynthia to church on Sundays and when my mom fired Cynthia because she cried too much from homesickness and from missing her daughter Wanda, who was my exact same age but lived thousands of miles away in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And the term was not in use when my mom politely asked our cleaning lady, Ida, to polish the mirrors and then fired Ida because Ida scolded me for smearing the mirror she had just finished polishing. In fact, my own feelings about microaggression have changed more in the years since I wrote these poems than in the decades since I lived them. I've been educated belatedly, I regret, by the news of the day. So while I used to think naively that microaggressions represented a vestige or an ushering out of a far more violent and horrific racism that was finally coming to a close in this country, I now understand microaggression to be an enabler of violence and hatred, a decorous, and as these poems might say, polite camouflage behind which the ugly violence just keeps on happening. That said, I'll start by reading sheets. You find it. The second maid, Della, less slender than Ida, not so graceful in her movements from room to room, slides her comfortable body between the two twin beds in the master bedroom in order to strip them and smooth on fresh sheets. Not infrequently, she talks with the child while cleaning the, clum cleaning the clumsy introverted middle girl who talks too much, although at other times, Della chats ami amiably enough with the missus, like if it's time to fix lunch, the missus always reading books or preparing something special for supper in advance. Such a funny chef she is, arising home from Jeff's seafood with sacks of lobster for the family, and on other days, Swanson's and foil trays. Della's legs in thick stockings scritch sideways between two shoved apart mattresses, since instead of one bed, the doctor's wife and the doctor sleep on two twin beds, under not one but two fitted sheets pressed neatly together under one top sheet, so no one can tell. Static slaps against the ceiling as De Della flips open one tw twin sheet and then another and then the big sheet on top. The middle child, the clumsy talker, so unlike the older da daughter who chats with her friends and stays busy somewhere, emerges from the bathroom, the master bath, where Candy the dog falls asleep sometimes, such as inside the glassed-in shower stall, such as if one of the daughters traps it there, Candy simply lays down on the cool, scrubbed tile, thumping her tail. The middle daughter brings an odor of poop with her out of the bathroom, although here in the house with the doctor father, they call poop BM, even the children call it that. You wash your hands, Della calls. The child says yes. So let me see, Della calls, tugging hard at the three sheets, smoothing the contours, soon fetching six pillowcases, nothing pretty about them, she says to herself, but is this okay to put? to put words and her thoughts into words into Della. The child sidles backwards into the bathroom. There's a sound of running water, the swip of a towel. The towel will need to be hung back up again. So let me see, Della calls. So now the child glides forward, hands stiff against the front of her. The girl is frightened of static. The way it hides amid the sheets, jumps out with a crackle that really does hurt. Taking two small hands into her big hands, Della rotates each finger, but never brusquely, only greeting the tips with her soft, deft round ones. Good job, she affirms. Still the child sidles further between the two beds, which share just one headboard, so that the beds pushed apart in a V for bed making make between them one V. 
So when the child sidles nearer into the V, she and Della squish up into one squished person. The little girl turned six a week ago. You can tell sometimes when she gets near speaking, the child works her utterances more carefully than you might think. And for that reason, you develop a habit of preparing to answer her mindfully, but in a manner still fit for a child's ears, as would a governess or nanny. For instance, if the child asks, what's the diff between a governess and a nanny? Della answers, difference. Also, governesses live in fancier houses, fancier than this one, or oh, this one is bigger than the house they moved out of, as are the trees all up and down Wedgwood Lane, a road with only three houses, too many trees, and yet another dog, Cato, living next door the size of two fire trucks. At last, the girl opens her mouth to speak. It's the color of your skin, she says. Della told me you said something mean to her, the mom says next week, when Della never comes back. The four of them are in the car, the mom and three daughters, the two other daughters not listening. The car is stopped at the light at Jericho Turnpike while traveling most likely the Miracle Mile to buy the pink dress with the wide brown sash for the middle daughter, the Ma's Paisley A-line dress for the older daughter, the apron dress for the younger. One day, the older girls will receive their first sex talk at just this intersection, the doctor's wife in the driver's seat facing the road, the sisters in the back seat regarding her knuckles pink against the steering wheel, the facets blinking here and there among the four or five rings the dad buys for her birthdays. Someday, boys will want to touch your nipples, maybe even kiss them, but you should never let them. But then the light turns green, so that's the end of the sex talk which is a good thing. I didn't mean to, said the daughter. You didn't mean to say the mean thing or you didn't mean it to be mean. To be mean, the girl answers. The light changes just then so the car gets moving. The mom allows from now on, remember, think before you speak and say you're sorry, apologize. I'm not sorry, thinks the girl I was thinking, she thinks. And for years, she will feel as if misunderstood about it. And still the question remains, nearly 60 years later, did Della not come back because Della wished not to? Or was Della let go as the mom came to call it? The daughter can ask, the mom and dad both dead. The static startles the bedspread atop her one bed to make it look like two beds to lie down on together. The second poem that I'm going to read tonight, and I will only read three of them because they're long, um, has to do with Cynthia. Um, Cynthia was from St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and when she arrived at our house, she was carrying a small suitcase with her, just one small suitcase. And this was about the time that Mary Poppins was, the movie came out, and if you remember, Mary Poppins too had a small suitcase, and magical things emerged from that suitcase. I spent hours in Cynthia's room watching her take things out of that suitcase. And I think these poems in a way came out of that suitcase too. This is Cynthia's voice. Dear Wanda, I live in the little room. The little room is upstairs between the playroom and the attic. The playroom is where I put away toys. The family beds are downstairs on both ends of the house, three daughters down one hall, master bedroom down the other. The little room has slanted ceilings, or rather only one ceiling with one silly big slant. So when I stand up from reading your letters, Wanda, I all too often bang my head on it. The house is two stories high, dear Wanda, but from the window in the little room, the little dormer window, it appears I'm looking out from a tower across the tops of a forest of trees. The trees are too big here on Wedgwood Lane, Wanda. The dogs too, Wanda. Please write me a letter every day. The middle daughter has never seen airmail stationery. She covets your penmanship. She wants to be friends. It's neater than hers. She means to write you one day, a missive in code. She likes to slice open the envelope. She likes to button, unbutton the top of my pen. She likes the touch of my hairnet, likes to pat it and pluck it, likes to smooth, likes to write, likes to read all our letters. 
When snow falls, Wanda, I'll send you a photo from the middle daughter's camera. She lost a super ball in here last week in the little room. We haven't been able to find it. Also, my hairpins, my bobby pins, I'll need to buy new ones. It's a swinger, the camera. It swings from her wrist. It makes the photos right there in her hands when she takes them. Dear Charles, last night there came a knock at the door. The front door of the house, not the door in the back, where we all six of us were sitting, eating our suppers. I sit at the counter. They sit at the table. I sit facing away from them into the kitchen where they can look at the buttons at the back of my uniform, Charles. I need to button with care, my hair looped neatly in the hairnet. I sit straight as can be on a high stool, no chair, a stool facing the meat slicer. And when the doorbell rang, I went to answer it, Charles. I think that's part of my job. Nobody was there, but then I saw that the storm door had been kicked in. There was glass on the mat. I let out a scream. The doctor phoned the police. Charles, I don't like this airmail stationery. It has not enough room. The page fills up too fast. The police came with clipboards. They didn't sit on the couch. They stood up with their clipboards. They wrote down the things that the doctor said. The doctor's wife said the picture window in the dining room has no curtains since the new curtains are being sewn by Cynthia, our maid. The cops wrote this down too. People were watching us eat, she said. People stood outside the window and watched us at our meal at our dining room table. The dog, Candy, didn't bark. I was crying, Charles, but the girls weren't crying. It was only me crying. Not even the doctor's wife was crying. The police asked, is there a boyfriend? The other police said, the maid. Does the maid have a boyfriend? They all turned their heads to wonder. I told them, no, I do not. I told them what they believe. I told them it's my husband, Charles's grandma's spirit who comes to kick at the door some nights when she's lonely. I told them what they believe. I told them she's lonesome. I said she never intended to break the glass. She's a spirit, I told them. Some spirits kick glass some nights with no intention of breaking it. I told them what they would believe. They didn't write this down. I told them, Charles, you'll inst instruct your grandma never to come here ever again. Soon I was asked politely to go upstairs. The policeman asked the doctor's wife to ask me, so she asked me politely, since she always asks politely, so I went upstairs politely. I sat on my bed in the little room, Charles, not in the playroom. I didn't feel like sewing curtains, even skirts, dear Wanda. I'll feel like sewing skirts again tomorrow, I hope. Also, Charles, I think I'm now taller than you. Since when I finally stood up from my bed in the little room, I said to myself, now don't hit your head on that awful slanted ceiling. But still, Wanda, I did, I still do. I always do, still always hit my head on it, Charles. Um, again, we learn things as we go along. And it was just two weeks ago, I think I read, I read in the newspaper that um, real estate agents are considering not using the terms master bedroom and master bath any longer. They're going to call them primary bedroom and primary bath. Uh, this other poem brings us up to date, sort of. It's called Front Porch. For some years after her marriage is over, the doctor's daughter lives on Main Street in a house she loved for its broad front porch. The porch isn't a wraparound. The house is too cozy and small for a wraparound, but she enjoys that too about it. It's just rightness for just one single mom. She can scrub it, dust it, sweep it, sponge it, mop it. No problem, her boys helping out. Maybe, though probably not. But the tidy, modest cube of it, the shutters on the windows, and in the big picture window, a BB hole she likes. Since when her boys put their fingers on the starboard, glass, they can feel no broken part, just the inner pain unbroken. There's a metaphor there, only she's not saying. She likes sitting on the porch wearing one of her long flowing post-divorce skirts, reading books or writing thoughts on her students' weekly packets while drinking pomegranate sun tea iced in a jar. 
let's say it's 96, maybe 97. She's 40 or so. She'll need to have the hysterectomy three years later. And then the breast cancer too will make rather a mess of some parts of herself. But for now, she is whole, just out of her marriage, her body whole, herself freshly unbothered. There's a redneck sort of guy she digs who works for Wisconsin Public Service who once showed up at the house to check for carbon monoxide fumes in the basement, but she has never expressed her interest in him. She hasn't even caught sight of him in four or five months, not even in the trucks, the big Wisconsin Public Service trucks lurching by. She sits drinking red tea on the porch one day when a black man who passes now and then on the sidewalk and calls up at her to wonder, how are you doing this fine afternoon or where are your sweet little babies today? Finally stops on his way past the house to say, excuse me, pretty lady, may I join you on that porch? She answers, sure, come on up. Black men have a nicer, more interesting way of coming on to ladies than white men do. She knows from where she used to live in Oberlin, Ohio. Like if a white guy mumbles, um, I'm like, like, so would you mind if I help you like load those bags into your trunk? A black guy says, wish I had that swing in my backyard. And if a white guy says, um, like, like maybe I can carry them into the parking lot for you. A black guy steps up in the middle of the aisle saying, hey, can you tell me where they keep the honey in here? There's a love seat on the porch and two Adirondacks, less rotten, of, less rotten of which is the chair in which she's sitting. So he slides into the other more spongy Adirondack to tell her his name. Although now that their proximity is finally established, it's clear at once to both of them he's too young for her by decades. She could be his professor, all her paper, books, tea on the stool between them. A pen disappeared amid the folds of her skirt. She remembers that skirt, even decades later, the way she dropped stuff in it, forgot what stuff was kept there, shared stuff from it, gave stuff away. Still, they chat for a while to be polite about living in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, and which cities they'll choose if they leave here for elsewhere, and how here on Main Street you need to shut the windows tight in order for the house to stay quiet enough to even talk on the phone, and how high the road floods, the road floods after the rain, so high the Salvation Army drove round afterwards once to hand out bottled water. So the kid next door hung over the porch rail with his tongue sticking out like he'd passed away in the exact opposite of the nick of time. That neighbor family is the Geens, she tells her visitor. So to everyone they meet, they always start out by saying, not that Gein, we're not related, meaning not Ed Gein, the butcher of Plainfield, 76 miles south of here on US 100, who murdered two or more people and fashioned keepsakes from the skins, bones, hair, and fingernails of exhumed corpses. Still, she hasn't so much as offered her visitor iced tea yet when one of the big Wisconsin public service trucks wheezes up at the curb. It isn't possible yet since Main Street isn't widened yet for big trucks to park at the curb without blocking traffic. So ordinarily the trucks yaw into the driveways, but this one lurches to the curb. And when the door swings open, out jumps the guy she hasn't laid eyes on since he tested the basement for carbon monoxide the redneck sort of guy she digs, but well-read since he had paused to admire her bookshelves, even poetry, even books she is holding for when her boys grow up, even books she's never read, cookbooks, her dead mom's scribbled notes in the margins, such as sweet, not salted, such as cut by half, and other books she's never opened, books she'll hang on to for maybe years later, such as maybe if she takes them down when she is 60, which for the record she is, but she hasn't, she might find she'll grow fond of, moved by, attached to some of things she finds written there. The white guy's crew cut anyway is one of the things she digs about him since her ex wore a ponytail. Crew cut leaps up on the porch steps and says, you okay? She answers, sure, thanks, I'm fine. Okay then, I just wanna make sure you're good, he repeats, not glancing at her visitor in the rotting Adirondack, glancing only at her but not meeting her eyes, which is exactly how he didn't when he checked on the leak in the basement either. Then off he bounds down the porch steps, gets back in his Wisconsin public service truck and is driven away 
since he isn't the driver. There's another crew cut in there. He must have said to him, pull over. I got to check on this lady. Something looks, I don't know. I got to see if she's okay with it. Not long after that, her visitor, Jerome, she remembers his name even 20 years later, says goodbye and strolls away down the sidewalk. The Afro, she still calls it. She doesn't know the new word for it. If there is a new word or two or three words for it, frosty with light above the squared off shoulders, the t-shirt loose but well-fitting, strumming a breeze. She tells herself maybe Jerome doesn't know. She supposes this in earnest. For days she makes herself suppose it. She tells herself probably I'm the only one of the two of us, me and Jerome, who caught on to what exactly was happening here, the hole from where the BB burst in the glass, not a cutting sort of sharp, but not a metaphor either. Either that or it was me being older, me being older than him, being nearly his great grandma's age that did it, caused Jerome to walk away, never passing along on the sidewalk again since he's moved to Chicago, Green Bay, Milwaukee, Bloomington, Minneapolis, Champaign, or St. Louis. But have we spoken of how romantic the doctor's daughter is in those post-divorce years, her blousey skirts, making practically everything, including motherhood, yard work, even house cleaning sexual. She props her feet on the love seat, noting for the hundredth time the wicker being made, not a wicker, but plastic, but it looks like wicker. And that's that. Thank you. Thank you. There was a few, you. there was a few people that joined late, so. Very nice you, read, thank you. Yeah, if you if you joined late, you were listening to Abby Fruit reading from her latest poetry collection, Maids, and there are link. There's a link to buy books in the chat. Okay, so are you ready? Catherine. I'm ready. Okay, Catherine Coppola is our next featured reader. Catherine is the author of two full-length poetry collections including Stick Figure Whisker, winner of the 2019 Main Street Rag Poetry Book Award. She's also published six chapbooks and produced a poetry music CD called Lip. She's been published in over 300 other places and earned 50 plus awards for her poetry and essays, including the Laureen Nidecker Poetry Award. She is a passionate advocate for the arts, helping to launch the Wisconsin Poet Laureate Commission the Wisconsin Fellowship of Poetry Chapbook Prize, and the Poetry Unlocked Reading Series. Please welcome Catherine. Thank you, everyone. Um, I just want to say first um, how much I really appreciate you guys all being here. I know how painful Zoom meetings can be. I'm on them a lot during the day. Um, but it's been really hard for artists this year. It's been hard for all of us, but for, um, I, I don't want to put words in Abby's mouth, but both of our books came out about the same time. We had this great plan for doing readings and uh, you know all over the state and, and throughout the Midwest. And um, my first big book launch thing was supposed to happen in San Antonio. So the couple of days before the entire world closed down. And so it's really hard to promote a book like this. So I just appreciate you listening. Um, if you like it, I hope you'll, you'll buy. Yeah, thank you, Tom. I hope you'll buy our books um, or share our books with others. Help spread the word. Thank you, Catherine. Yay, a whole wall of my book. Well, you guys already have it. So I, we can just go now. Kidding. So I'm going to read, um, I don't know, a handful of books. Um, and Abby, I agree, you're getting lots of comments. It's terrific, terrific reading. I just love that book. And I love, you'll, you'll see that Abby's book and my book are, in some respects, very different, very different styles. But we started talking about reading together um, without really understanding what our two books were about. And as we've done a few of these readings, we've come to realize they really are both about women at work and um, what women face in the working world. 
and um, work being defined somewhat loosely too. Some of the poems in my book are about the work of dying. There are a couple of poems about cancer. Um, so just, you know, that, that thread of work and how women endure or attempt to endure. Um, so I'll start. This is not a poem I normally start with, but um, in the middle of a pandemic, it seems really appropriate. It's, it's called The Evolution of Touch. Paige. Oh, sorry, I hear somebody. Okay, The Evolution of Touch. We could go back to Adam and the apple the tomb of Akman Thor, Excalibur, or the Eskimo kiss, Odysseus pining for Penelope, Joni loving Chachi. But this, now the de-evolution, motion-operated toilets, sinks, dryers, the airport x-ray wand, the e-ticket scan, or a flight with no jet engine, brother on the coast, connecting screen to screen, yap and kiss without lip to lip or a car that responds to lip, call Peter, mobile, or find fuel. No more finger on a yellow page, no distance measured on an unfolded map, even when destination home steers me to Oklahoma. Touch now is indexed, the new hokey pokey, our whole selves ottered, perpetually smudged, Touch now a rub of microfiber, compressed air in a can. Whole friendships compressed into likes and tweets and shares. And like John Travolta in The Boy in the Plastic Bubble, there can be no press of flesh without near certain death. Had no idea, obviously, when I wrote that, that the near certain death would actually be sort of true. And, uh, the next poem is sort of along that same vein, um, and uh, I'll just read it. It's called The Zombie Speaks, and it starts with an epigraph from Casey and the Sunshine Band that goes, I'm your boogeyman, that's what I am. I should really learn to sing that, right? And do a, everybody come, yeah, everybody sing with me. <laughs> um, the Zombie Speaks. Unfortunately, it's not a funny poem. I remember when I first wrote this, um, my lovely friend Carla Houston is here and she's my, my first reader. She's like, I thought it was going to be funny. That's not funny, so forewarning. The Zombie Speak. For the first time in my life, looks don't matter and my purpose is clear. The judge in me has turned her verdict outward. There are no words for this. Both times I came into this world through blood, into an insatiable hunger, an instinct to survive, a reflex response to touch. Both times, a tiny magic. It's that dream of fleeing, but the hall gets longer and the body is quicksand, the invisible weight, the invisible monster looming. I try not to fixate on the mortal wound, the nine to five trudge, seek only to live authentically here and now, one of my twin souls hungry. So a lot of the poems in this book are about the journey of working in the corporate world. I always joke about being like a, a poet in, a, in business clothing. Um, but sometimes I also think I'm a business person in public clothing. So it, it kind of works both ways. Um, so this next poem is the title poem. It's called Six Figure Whisker. And it um, really, for me, kind of um, typifies how I think a lot of women are treated in the world. Six Figure with Skirt is the universal sign for the women's restroom, unless you are in Hawaii or a cowboy bar. Six figure with skirt is a universal symbol of fashion, AKA allure, AKA Kate Moss. Six figure with skirt holding hands with other six figures is the universal minivan mom, making sure we know she is loved by her six figure family. See them? They are all six smiling. Six Figure with skirt is not available on stickfiguregames.com. No zombie shooter, no sniper assassin, no stick girls allowed. 
Even at girlgames.com, the sick chicks are naked or suicidal. Thick figure in pencil skirt and heels is the universal sign for career woman. But notice she has no mouth, no eyes, no opposable thumbs on her two stick hands. Beneath that stick figure skirt is slip. Beneath that slip spanks. Beneath spanks two bare sticks like scissors forever cutting her flesh into smaller sticks and smaller still until she is kindling toothpick, the universal sign of beauty. I don't know why, but I'm, uh, oh, and if you have questions or comments or smart remarks, go ahead. It's very hard. I love to read when I can interact with the audience and it's, this is sometimes painful, but I get the whole muting thing too. So um, anyway. I'll just I don't care. I love that poem. Oh, <laughs> thank you, Charlie. Thanks. No, that's okay. You can you can chime in all you want. Um, oh gosh, thanks, Catherine. I see. I told you where's Catherine. I told you I would forget to give you the page numbers. Um, next one I'm going to read is called Open Season, and it is on page 46. Turn your hymnals now to page 46, and everybody rise. Just kidding. Um, so this isn't a poem I normally read. In fact, it's a really old poem that I sort of didn't like for a really long time. And then when I was working on this book, I felt like there were a couple of gaps and I, I didn't really know how to fill them. So I went back to the well and I found some old poems that sort of fit and then I worked them a little bit. And I chose to read this one because my, it, well, I'll, I'll read it and then I'll, and I'll share my little story. Open season. I'm calling my son again to say good night. In this way, I am home before bedtime. Today, he's had enough, wants no more kisses across a wire, the strong hug of a black box. He hangs up without speaking. In an office 20,000 arm lengths away, I click the desk lid on, off, off, on. In the morning before I leave again, he says he'll forgive me for Fruit Loops as he points with a stick, a piece of birch curled under like a trigger. Ga, 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 he yells as he jab, jabs his weapon in my direction. From his angle, it's a gut shot, bullet bouncing off my weak heart and pinballing my organs till I tilt. I try to pull him toward me, but he shoots again. I have killed myself in my mind a thousand times, and tomorrow I will die again. But this is too much. My son wanting me dead. Wanting to stand over my slumped form like a wounded bird in the grass. Bang, bang, I shoot back with my finger, and he begins to wail. Why don't die, he pleads until I'm reduced to ashes in an urn or sweeping myself from a cold fire, until I finally let him finish me off. So I'm reading that poem because my baby is 21 now, and Sunday we just moved him into his apartment. Um, and we you know, moved him to college before, which was very painful. In fact, he just came back tonight because he's got to work this weekend here. And he said, Mommy, you didn't cry when I left this time. I'm like, well, I was crying inside. It, this one feels really permanent because he took everything with him this time. He didn't leave anything behind. So oh, I'm going to get all emotional. I might have to have Abby read again. Um, so I, I struggled a lot. If you've read my book, at all, or if you know me at all, I have um, had a lot of jobs. And um, I, in, in, in almost every, every case, um, I moved on to a bigger, better opportunity. There was one time, though, when I chose to quit a job without another job, which is a, if you've ever, ever done that, if you've, it's a super scary thing to do. Uh, this poem's called, What Do You Do? What do you do when America asks, well, what do you do? 
and you no longer do anything except pocket the swear jar coins and look for a job that doesn't send you to inpatient or shelter. I forgot Catherine, it's page 71, sorry. When America follows with, where are you from? Or where do you go to church? But without what you do, you are from nothing. So you leave the house less, pray to the pantry more. When you try on new titles like bathing suits, but none of them fit, and who really wants to be that flesh exposed? When 2.6 million Americans lost jobs, they clung to, while I walked away, clung too hard to my Jan Brady ideals, thought sticks and stones could not have hurt so much. In other countries, asking what you do is offensive. They start instead with hobbies or sports, but we turn a means to an end into sport, like base jumping or Russian roulette, the running of the bull. Just a couple more. I love that poets always like to like tell you only two more. I'm sorry, you just have to stay through two more. I'm sorry. That's what it always sounds like to me, but I still do it all the time. Um, I so I have two poems that I read at almost every reading. Um, I get asked to read them a lot, which is very nice. Um, the first one is um, that is the first poem in the book called. Uh, nine Ways of Riding, of uh, Rising, excuse me. Um, I tried to write this one after writing all those, oh, what am I going to do poems? I tried to look at it from a different angle, and that's where this poem came. Um, and I credit this poem to a uh, poet friend, Jeannie Tomasco, who writes these fabulous, fabulous list poems. And uh, one of her poems sort of inspired this form. And this also has an epigraph, this one by John Bon Jovi. Uh, that goes, success is falling nine times and getting up 10. Nine ways of rising. One, another poet would conjure angels or zombies. Two, hashtag revolutionaries, curtains, bubbles, bread, heat, smoke, phoenix, moon, sea levels. Three, 424 astronomers demoted Pluto. Alan Stern, leader of NASA's New Horizons mission to Pluto, calls this a farce, vows that Pluto will never, or excuse me, will rise again. Four, I took one of those online personality quizzes, discovered I will spend eternity in Dante's eighth circle of hell for fraud. I don't believe in hell. I have retaken the test three times and have worked my way up to wrath. Five, my husband's voice climbs when he talks politics or stocks. I find it hard to sit and listen. Six, I like it here, flat, on my back on the cool tiles, black ant tickling my ear, fingers splayed over my eyes to block the light. Seven, don't make me come up there. Eight, the hotel. Tell maid found him in the tub, five pints down, looking like Picasso's The Weeping Woman. I don't know where she works now. We keep his urn on a top shelf. Nine, the Supreme Court, innings, tic-tac-toes, holes of golf, the fellowship of the ring. This has nothing to do with rising. Ten. The average worker will hold 10 different jobs in his or her lifetime. I am above average. I try to remember that one. It's hard when you live in Northeast Wisconsin and most people, a lot of people stay in their jobs for like 34 years, you know, and if you leave jobs every 10 years, you're like, you know, my mom, well, you're quite the job hopper. I'm like, I was in that job for eight years, for God's sake. Well, you know, she was. She was in the same job since high school. So I'm a job hopper, of course. So anyway, um, I'm going to end with one more poem. Um, and this one is a little bit more, um, it's a little odd. I've had people say, I don't really understand that poem. And this, it's really intended not to make a lot of sense. It's more about the emotion. Um, and I like to end with this one. It's called Resignation Notice. 
And I see it as kind of a reminder to all of you that if you ever see me like this, you have to tell me because that means it's, it's time for me to leave again. So resignation notice. If you find me head down at my desk, if you find me head down at my desk in my pinstripe suit, blouse untucked and stockings run in my pinstripe suit and blouse stocking. If my untucked head feels the run in me and makeup runs in pinstriped rows, or I'm dictating gibberish to an empty chair, I'm dictating gibberish to an empty chair. Certain this is how to work. Certain this is the how we work. I'm climbing this work, this chair, this empty dictator. I'm climbing over empty, please memo me home, please memo me home, and leave a post-it note and note my leaving. Please home me, please. If my pin strikes a certain running, my untucked stockings empty, my gibberish dictating, and the ladder finds me, and I'm the ladder, I'm the leader, I'm the desk, and you're my lost gibberish, please just pinstripe me. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. You can unmute now. All right. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Good job. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Both of you. And applause for Abby, too. She was awesome. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Yes. yes. Thank you all for coming. That was wonderful. That was awesome. Yes. Yeah. yeah. We'll do this again. We'll One do this again. Thanks for being here. Appreciate you doing yes. it. Yep, we'll do this again. Yes, cool. thank that you, everyone. Good. Thank you. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Bye. All righty. Bye. 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 Well. It's, it's wonderful to see actual people. I <laughs> know. <laughs> 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 and poets. And poets. <laughs> A gathering of actual people. Whoa. <laughs> I had a reading where you like both of the features. Yes. <laughs> That's very nice. <laughs> and all the rest of you. That was really nice. That's cool. Thanks, Charlie. Nice yeah. to hear all you voices. Thanks I don't know. Charlie. Yeah. All right. You're a good babe. Cool. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Catherine, I'm a job hopper, too. I know. I saw your comment, Laura. You were yeah. awful. You're a horrible human being, Laura. <laughs> the longest I've been in a job is six and a half years. That's the longest. <laughs> That's pretty good. That's pretty good. But are and, you happy? Have you always found it landed on your feet? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. For the yeah. most part. Yeah, I got the one that was six and a half years was the one I got kicked out of. <laughs> uh, you know, reduction yeah. in force. Oh, yeah. So, That's yeah that's hard that's yeah hard. yeah but i can you know, totally relate to the uh, you know i've been at this job this is actually my second longest job now so yeah <laughs> like uh oh better watch yeah. out or i might get restless <laughs> my best job was as a clam sorter oh my oh gosh. my gosh seriously <laughs> I was working for an archaeologist at the university, and he was looking at the sex gender distribution of the clams in this one room. <laughs> in my job, there were huge barrels of clam shells, and you have to count the little notches, you know, and that oh there's a difference between the female shells and the males, unless they're too young, which in which case you can't see. So I would sit there for hours looking at these notches and saying, female, 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 male. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> I think you will win wow. the award for the for one of the worst jobs. It's hardly a corporate job. Well, I've had some of those weird jobs too. And believe me, there are yep. days I would much rather stand and sort female clams than male clams. <laughs> I, I sold AAA memberships over the phone, cold calling out of the phone oh. book back oh. in the day. <laughs> Thanks, Greg. Yeah, I can, I've, 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 I've done sales too. Oh, I, I, oh my gosh. I once had to try to sell electronic hydraulic positioner governor unit for an electric company. I didn't even know what they were. How the heck am I supposed to sell one to anybody? <laughs> <laughs> yeah.
Yeah. <laughs> I didn't do very good on that one. So, hey, Tori, great job. Thanks for yes. facilitating. I hope Thank this worked well for you. Right. Yeah, it, it was good. And we had like 31 people at one point. Yep. Yeah. That's that was cool. good. That was good. That's cool. Do it again. Do it again. I will. All right. I will do it again. Thank you, Catherine. Thank All right. I'm signing off, everyone. All right. Bye. 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 B